This Friday, I had a very informative Friday. I learned a lot at the, while we were having the Asian Theological Forum. And this evening, we have another presentation. If you were not able to attend, you will be able to at least uh, attend this one. And our speaker is Dr. Arceli Rosario. She's the chair of the education department here at the graduate school at IAS. She was also part of the SSD research team that did the church member survey in 2013 and in 2017. And the title is also very interesting. The title is Stories of Conversion, Retention, and Reclamation, the South Asian Experience. So at this moment, I would like to request your attention as we listen to the presentation. Good evening, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Uh, I praise the Lord for this opportunity to share the study that I did with my colleagues, and you can see our names here. With me are uh, Carthy Joy Aguilion, Dr. Jimmy Adil, Engineer Opao, and Dr. Susa Opao, all of them from Mountain View College. I'm coming from IAS. The title of our study is Stories of Conversion, Retention, and Reclamation, the Southeast Asian Experience. I would like to acknowledge the General Conference for providing funding to this study, and also for SSD for uh, taking charge of the dispersing and assisting us in contacting the unions and missions and conferences. And also, we would like to thank the unions, the missions and conferences all over SSD for uh, helping us with the data gathering, and also the sample churches and our translators and encoders. Uh, I would like to give you a brief background of the coming of the message in Southeast Asia. The message in Southeast Asia came through literature evangelists and foreign missionaries in the 1900s. And uh, in Vietnam specifically, and even also in uh, Cambodia and uh, Laos. Evangelism stopped in the 1970s due to peace and order conditions, but uh, Seventh-day Adventist missionaries um, put up centers in the refugee camps, and many of these refugees were converted to the Adventist church. In 2017, there are more than 1.1 million Seventh-day Adventists in Southern Asia Pacific Division, and most of these members come from Indonesia and the Philippines. But if you will notice that this 1.1 million uh, Seventh-day Adventist church members actually comprise only of 0.18% of the population of Southeast Asia. So uh, what is the statement of the problem? The gospel message entered Southeast Asia more than 100 years ago, but today there are only 1.1 million members of the church, which is only 0.18%, not even 1% of the entire population. And according to the study of Center for Creative Ministry of Andrews University in 2013, 
uh, based on the church members survey done worldwide, uh, one of the findings was that half of those who are baptized into the church are lost. Hence, the purpose of this study is through narrative inquiry. The purpose of the study is to document conversion, retention, and reclamation stories of Adventist church members in South Southeast Asia and to identify conversion, retention, and reclamation themes given in the Southeast Asian context. So these are the research questions like how are 70 Adventist church members converted into the church, what relationships and experiences help them to stay and make them leave and also make them come back to the church. Uh, for our methodology, so this is a qualitative research, specifically we use narrative inquiry. It is a research design that makes use of first-person accounts of their experiences and uh, they tell the events of their lives in story form. Uh, the main feature or characteristic of narrative inquiry is the restorying. You know, your participants may tell their story. Usually they tell their story in random sequence, but then the researchers put together the story in chronological frame. Uh, here is our research setting, the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia, but we focused specifically on Southern Asia Pacific Division countries. There are, uh, there are, 14 countries in SSD, and for this study, this is the qualitative part. We also have the quantitative part, and that's the church member survey for uh, 2017. We did, uh, we covered only 11 countries, such as, um, I'll show that one in the next slide. So here, we have here the demographics of Southeast Asia with a population of uh, 593,410,000. And you will see here that the dominant religion is Islam with 40.38%, followed by Buddhism and then Christianity. So Christianity here has only 21.33%. So if you look at the totality of this population, the Seventh-day Adventist church members do not even make for 1%. It's only 0.18%. So for our sampling, we did purposive sampling. We got 54 participants coming from 11 countries, from Malaysia, Philippines, Timor-Leste, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, Myanmar, Singapore, and Sri Lanka. Uh, we got 13 participants who were born Adventists and stayed in the church. 23 were converted and stayed in the church. Seven were born Adventists, left the church, and were reclaimed. 12 were converted, left the church, and were reclaimed. And there were 30 males and 24 females. So these were our selection criteria, we gather data by unions, and for those countries, like for example, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, although they are only like mission, we also got the same number of participants because they are one country. So these are our data sources. We conducted in-depth interviews face-to-face, -face, but we, uh, for our follow-up, we did telephone and emails. We did also observation, document analysis, and our analytic memos. Now, since this is a narrative inquiry, uh, the main feature is uh, storytelling. I have chosen here two part stories of two participants about their con conversion, retention, and reclamation experiences. You may follow me as I read aloud. This is the story of Keona. My father was a monk. One day he met a Christian missionary who told him to go to a Sunday-keeping church. 
he did, but later joined the Adventist church. I was baptized into the Adventist church. When I was 16, it was arranged for me to be married to a man about three times my age. I left the church. My husband and I were financially well off, but our marriage was a very unhappy one. I always thought about God, but instead of going back to him, I went to and spiritists. When nothing worked, I told myself, only God can provide solutions to my problem problems. I divorced my husband and decided to start a new life. I knew I could have it only if I came back to God. I missed the time when I was young. I remembered how I enjoyed being in the church and how I had peace. So I went back to the church, but my trials did not end. My son became a gangster. Later, he died in a motorbike accident. Two years after my son died, my six-year-old grandson also died. He was a very sweet boy. He liked coming to church with me. I asked God why. I wanted to know the answer to my suffering. As I prayed, I seemed to hear God telling me that I should spend more time with him, that I should know him more. So that's what I do now. I spend time with God. I come to church very early and stay until the last program is finished. In God, I have found peace in spite of my pain. If I don't have God, I don't know what would happen to me. My problems are too big for me to bear. When I lost my grandson, I went into depression. I left the house where I lived with my grandson because the memories are too painful for me. Church members took turns taking me into their homes a week with each family. For five months, I moved from one family to another. At that time, I realized that I had found a true family in the church. Do you like this story? Here's another story, and this is the story of Somdi. One Wednesday night, I was cycling past the church. There was singing. I was attracted to it, so I entered. A foreign missionary welcomed me. He spoke my language very well. A local pastor preached about creation. I was intrigued. At the university, I learned that humans came from monkeys. The following week, I came back again. I wanted to know more about creation. I came back again and again. I liked the music very much. I met many young people people and we became friends. The pastor gave me a Bible and I started to read it. Many things drew me to the Bible, which I thought was real. I decided to be baptized. I met one pastor. He asked me if I was interested in working for the church. And if I was, he would give me a scholarship to earn another degree. I accepted the offer, went to an Adventist college in another country and took theology. After graduation, I was sent to a place where there was no Adventist presence. My partner and I taught English to lead the people to the Bible. After one year, we baptized 32 people, one of them a pastor of a Sunday-keeping church. My life was changed when I became an Adventist. I like the Adventist lifestyle, the way we eat, talk, conduct ourselves. I also like the church atmosphere. Here, we are like one family. We care for each other and even those outside the church. One day, one church member told me he missed his relatives in a very far remote village. I said, I'll accompany you to see them. It was the rainy season and the road was muddy. We walked and walked. I told my friend, we should ask God to send someone to help us. After a short while, we saw a couple walking down the hill. See, I said, God has sent us this couple to take us to your village. As the couple came closer, he opened his eyes wide. That's my brother, he exclaimed. The two hugged and cried. They had not seen each other for 10 years. The brother told us to wait because he would come with his truck, which had left at a repair shop. The truck came and we joined the couple. While we were traveling, I asked my friend's brother, have you heard about Christians? He answered, no. So I told him about Jesus. They were animists and believed that someone had created the world. He said, maybe we have the same God. I asked him if I could share God in his village. If the village chief would not put me in jail, he assured me that the village chief would not put me in jail, especially if the chief knew that my brother is a Christian. Really? He is kind? Yes, very kind. Do you know the chief very well? Yes, very well. Then he turned to me and said, Kamli, I am the chief of the village 
I was stunned. My friend was stunned too. He didn't know that his brother was the chief of his village. So for two days, I taught the village people. Eight people were baptized. We sent them a missionary, and today we have a church there with 200 members. Three years ago, I accompanied one of our workers to visit his girlfriend in another province. We drove all day until dusk, but we were still far from our destination. We didn't have food, and we were in the jungle. We had to cross a river. When we did, the engine stopped. The car struck a big rock. We pushed and pushed the rock, but it would not budge. I told my friend and another companion to go to the village and ask for food. When they came back, the village chief was with them. He said, leave the car here and come to my house. He gave us food to eat and a place to sleep. He asked me, why are you here? I told him the reason of our coming. He asked me many questions. Are you Sunday keeping or Sabbath keeping? Sabbath keeping, I said. He smiled. I am Sabbath keeping also. He showed me his voice of prophecy certificate. We talked until morning. I realized God stopped us so I could talk with that man. Today, he is an Adventist, and all his village people are Adventists. We have a beautiful church there with 120 members. So if you notice, this chief and the village were already keeping the Sabbath, although they were not yet Adventists, because they learned it from voice of prophecy lesson. I have seen God's leading. God needs me to be his instrument. I am willing to work for the church, even without any pay. This man now is a pastor. He's president of one of our missions. My wife has a business. She supports me. She supports the church. She was baptized before our marriage. My father and my siblings have also joined the church. Amen. So these are examples of the 54 stories that we gathered around Southeast Asia. So now I would like to share with you our findings. Let's begin with the conversion themes. Now what is conversion? It is an act of vowing to become a new person and to live a new life. How do you know that the person is converted? He or she shows that through baptism. But the decision for baptism is not a one-time event or a sudden occurrence, but rather it is a process or it goes through different stages. So in many cases, a person's decision to be baptized is an interplay of several factors. We have here the cognitive and we have also the affective. The cognitive, that is the knowledge of the truth, and the affective is a person's decision to trust God. Now, we got several themes for conversion, but we found out that there are two themes for conversion. These are the attracting factors. These are the factors that attract people to the church and they say, okay, I will come back. I will keep on coming back, keep on attending, or maybe uh, keep on studying. And the other one is the deciding factors, which refer to relationships and experiences that led them to decide to accept Jesus. Here are the conversion themes. The first one here is initial contact. In Southeast Asia, our participants said that their initial contact mostly are, were with foreign missionaries. Foreign missionaries. And also, and then followed by the pastor and the church members. According to Ellen White, we need to cooperate with God. Human beings should be agents. Uh, Mrs. White says in selected, um, selected messages, she, said, she says that God is the unseen, imperceptible factor, but man is the humble and the seen agent so that people can come to God. The other one here is personal search. When a person is in trouble, you call this one critical events in a person's life, then they search for God. So we had participants who did not have any human factor. They were the ones who initiated to find an Adventist church because they said it was our search for God and God led us to the Adventist church. The other one is church visibility. If you notice, Somdi was just cycling 
one midweek prayer meeting. And then he heard the singing, and he was so attracted to the singing, he stopped, and he entered the church. Several cases was like this one. And uh, it was found out also by uh, studies in other denominations that the location of the church is very should be strategic because it is crucial. People are led to the church when they see the church or when they hear that there are services going on in the church. The other one is friendly atmosphere in the church. This is one big factor. Jesus Christ emphasized the importance of relationships. And if you remember, what did he say about, about, uh, about relationships? He said, by this, all men will know if you love one another that you are my disciples. So people will know that this is a special church. This is God's church. If they see that in this church we love one another and we also love those who come to join us. Another is public evangelism. This is quite strange because if you notice that the emphasis today is more on small groups. It seems like uh, public evangelism or holding evangelistic crusade is, crusades seem like already seems like uh, an unpopular method, not preferred. Yeah, small groups are more preferred. But in our study, we found out that there were still those who were converted through public evangelism. So I think we should not miss or we should not totally face out this approach. Another one is home influences. Mrs. White emphasizes the importance of the home. In fact, uh, in several studies, they say that the first contact of a person to the truth is through his or her parents. And another one is Adventist education. In Southeast Asia, where public evangelism is not allowed, or even just, you know, like um, sharing, you know, the gospel in other ways is prohibited. Adventist education has played a very important role. So those coming from uh, different religious orientation go to Adventist schools. That place has become a venue where they learn about God and then eventually they decide to be baptized. For us young people coming from Adventist church, that the Adventist school is also a place where they make the decision to be baptized, especially in church organized events like week of prayer. The other one here is authority of the Bible. Uh, according to Farah, the written word of God surpasses other causes of conversion to Christ. In fact, 32 out of our 54 participants, whether born Adventist or converted, they attested that they made the decision to be baptized after a thorough Bible study. And in addition to the Bible study, they listened also to radio programs, to TV, Adventist TV programs, and also they uh, res corresponded this voice of prophecy lessons. They took these lessons. And among the doctrines that really struck them, that drew them to the church, uh, were the keeping of the Sabbath, the coming of Jesus Christ and God's love. The other one here is personal encounter with God. And we see this one very prominent in places where, uh, I mean, in countries where Christianity uh, was almost like very minimal presence. The, in places like uh, Buddhism, Hinduism uh, were prominent. God, this, 
decides to reveal himself in miraculous ways. For example, through miraculous healing, through answer, through specific prayers, so that uh, those who receive these uh, miracles, they say that there is no other cause except for a powerful God. The other one here is lives of believers. And according to one author, a consistent godly life of a Christian serves as a strong factor in conversion. And this statement has been affirmed by many studies. So uh, now we go to our retention themes. Conversion is a process. Retention is also a process. The question is, while... We are so zealous to bring converts into the church. The question remains, how do we have that same intensity of desire to keep them into the church? Sometimes we are only good in bringing people to church, and then we forget that it's also our responsibility to make them stay in the church. So among the themes that came out, our participants said they stayed in the church because of their relationship with God and the church. In the Philippines, while we have a very high conversion rate, we also have a very high rate of church members leaving the church. However, in Indochina, specifically Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia, we heard this phrase over and over, once an Adventist, always an Adventist. That's what they say. So, and the reason why they choose to stay in the church is because of this phrase, the church is family. Here in the church, this is family. That was repeated again and again. The other one is when church members hold voluntary church leadership role. When they are involved inside the church, such as teaching Sabbath school classes, or um, being an elder, or a deacon, a deaconess, they stay in the church. Another is when they, they say they stay in the church because they have a personal encounter with God. Like God is ever present, always revealing to them in miraculous ways. Another reason is when a church member is engaged in evangelism. There were other themes such as Bible reading, authority of the Bible, belief that the Adventist church is the true church, appreciation of the role of the spirit of prophecy, listening to Adventist radio and TV programs, living and sharing the Adventist lifestyle, and focusing on Jesus. Now, one question is, why do church members leave the church? One reason, according to Center for Creative Ministry, this is in Andrews, with 1,053 former members who left the church, one reason they cited why they left the church was because during a difficult phase in their lives, the church members did not show that they cared. And so caring is, an imp is important in the retention of church in the retention of members, like 40% of those who participated in the study uh, said that they left the church because no one contacted them. So why do church members leave the church? In Southeast Asia, these were the reasons that they gave. Misunderstanding in the church, falling into vices, marriage to a non-believer, occupational pressures we found out. There is one country in Southeast Asia where... Uh, work days, there are six days for work, and some of them just decide to work on Sabbath and weak biblical foundations. These weak biblical foundations, you know, was cited by seventh day, those who were born in the church, born as Adventist church members, and they said they were baptized without thoroughly understanding the teachings of the church or without a thorough Bible study. So, here, 
they say, I had a rush Bible study. I did not have much exposure to the truth. Hence, I fell away only a few months after baptism. When I left the church, I did not think I was wrong. After coming back, I realized that my faith was not deep enough. So most of those who fell into vices came from Adventist homes and left the church during their youth. Now, how does leaving the church happen? Just like conversion, just like retention, leaving the church is also a slow process. It's not like, okay, now I decide to leave the church. One participant said, little by little, then the interval gets longer and longer. Later, I just stop going to church. Now, what is the condition of missing members? This one really struck me because all of the participants who left the church said, I have never left God. Even though I did not attend the church, I still thought about the beliefs I endorsed when I accepted Jesus. I left the church for 25 years, but I continued to keep the commandments. Here's one participant from the Philippines. He said when he was out of the church, he had a longing for God. In fact, he said, every Sabbath, I wanted to go to church. But the struggle, the road back to the church is not easy. It's a very difficult struggle. See, one from Singapore said, I could not bring myself back. It was a big struggle. So, uh, what are the themes? Why do those who le left the church, why do they come back? And they say one big reason is because they had a personal encounter with God. One said he was touched by the Holy Spirit. This one coming from the Philippines said one day he was overcome by a strong sense of loneliness. And then he realized that God loves him. And he said, for the first time in years, I knelt and cried in prayer. And the other one said, he could hear Jesus calling him back. And there was one who dreamed twice in two consecutive nights, and he said, in my dream, God called me, called my name, and said, come back. So you see here, in conversion, in retention, in reclamation, we see that these are all the acts of God. And God, all throughout, decides to give man a personal encounter with him who is the divine power. And the other one said, and another theme, the participants who went back to the church said they went back because of the contact of church members. There was one who said that even though she left the church, the church members continued to contact her. So I think this is one lesson for us tonight or tomorrow. If there's one in the family who has left the church, I think that person is simply waiting for you to call him or her back. Cooperate with God and let's be instruments in calling these people back to the church. So in summary, we can say these are the conversion themes in Southeast Asia these are the reasons why people are converted to the church. And also, these are the reasons why they stay in the church. And these are the reasons why they leave the church and why they come back to the church. I would just like to highlight one sub-theme, and that is personal encounter with God. It runs through the three major themes. Now, what does this imply? This reveals that God is present at every stage of one's faith journey in the context of conversion, retention, and reclamation. You may come from another continent, but I pray that these findings may help you in bringing converts to the church, in helping people stay in the church, and in bringing back our missing members. This is our mission. May our good Lord continue to bless us as we cooperate with him.